All right, um, so I've got a couple things to talk about. Um, and then we will get into the material. So first of all, I greeted everybody's uh, lab one. Um, some people, there were pieces missing that you didn't get a chance to turn in. Um, and so if there's some piece that was missing, I noted what it was. And if you want to show me in your notebook, because my guess is those missing pieces are in your notebook. If you show me your notebook tomorrow in lab, don't do it today because I'll forget to write it down. Um, <laughs> If you show me your, in your notebook tomorrow, I will give you the points back. Um, so that's totally fine. Um, and like I said, you could show me today, but I would forget. So you can show me uh, tomorrow in lab, and I will actually remember. <laughs> um, also, speaking of lab tomorrow, the lab handout is posted. Um, it is it's Molly. Um, so that is ready to go. Um, we're going to be doing a, a lab using a technique called flow cytometry. Um, and so you'll hear more about that today. Um, just so you know, um, the one sort of bottleneck with this lab is, of course, that we only have one cytometer. Um, so what's going to happen is you guys are going to be prepping your samples. There are going to be some um, tasks that you can do kind of before or after you run the cytometer. So, you know, spread that out as you have time. And then groups are going to sign up as they're ready to use the cytometer. Um, so you might have a little bit of downtime um, tomorrow. And I think whenever I've done this before, we have always gotten out at 415, even the groups who are last on the machine. Um, but just be aware that it's possible things could run a little long, but I don't expect them to. Um, just if the machine goes a little wonky, then there could be some issues. Um, so be aware of that. Um, all of the stuff I just handed back to you, um, I have the grades recorded in my Excel spreadsheet, but I have not yet made the Moodle gradebook. That will be showing up soon. Um, and uh, today, um, we're talking about immunology techniques. Um, this, in fact, necessitated the schedule change that I sent you the email about. The updated schedule is available on um, the Moodle site, so you can take a look at that. Um, the reason why I uh, made this change is because I think this is going to give you a lot of information that is going to help out with tomorrow's lab. And so it makes sense to have this before tomorrow's lab. Um, I always do the techniques lecture and talk about this technique, flow cytometry, before we get to um, B cell development, which you will see is coming up shortly on the schedule. Um, because when we start talking about B cell development, I have to be showing you data acquired from flow cytometry. And so if you don't know what flow cytometry is, you're out of luck there. So we have to talk through flow cytometry. Um, I had this scheduled for next week. Um, right before we did B-cell development, and then I realized, boy, that's silly when we're going to hit it in lab first. So I just made the switch. Um, and flow cytometry is um, a very important technique that immunologists use and that we are going to be talking about and seeing throughout the semester. Um, it's sort of one of the workhorse techniques of immunology. Um, as a result, one of the things that is going to be really crucial for your ability to do well in this course um, this semester is your ability to read and understand data from a cytometer. Um, as a result, I put together an assignment with some flow cytometry data so that you can get some practice on that and I can catch any errors now before the first exam, before you see some data on the exam and things go wrong <laughs> instead of at the end. And so because we're talking about this information today, um, that assignment is also posted, and you should have the information to complete that assignment by the end of today's class. Um, that assignment will be due on Monday. Um, so it's posted. The due date is also listed as being due on Monday, but you will have the information at the end of today's class. Um, the point is really to help you practice reading that type of data so that as we encounter it more and more frequently throughout the semester, you'll have some experience, and I'll see where you might have issues to help you get ready to read it as you need to. Um, there was one question that has been a, uh, difficult on that assignment in past years. I tried to rewrite it last night to get rid of the things that were confusing. 
Um, but if you're having trouble with question five, let me know. That's the one I rewrote last night um, to try to make it less confusing. Um, so the other reason why it's really nice for us to talk about um, these techniques uh, at this point in the semester is that all of the techniques that I'm really going to talk about today have in common that they involve antibodies. And they involve us using antibodies in the lab. And so all of the things we're going to see techniques-wise are going to be applications of everything we've been talking about thus far with regard to antibodies. Um, and so we're going to see our trusty, trusty friendly antibody many times today. Um, all of these really take advantage of the fact that antibodies are able to bind antigen extremely specifically, or with exquisite specificity, as we said before. So because we have antibodies that can bind really, really, really specifically to a protein of interest, we can take advantage of that for a lot of different techniques. All of the techniques, or the vast majority of the techniques I'm going to tell you about, take advantage of the use of monoclonal antibodies as opposed to polyclonal antibodies. Um, we talked about this a little bit before. You'll see a little on the next couple slides. And so the first thing that I want to describe to you is the basics of how we make monoclonal antibodies in the lab, where they come from, um, which is yet another, as are many of the techniques we're going to talk about today, yet another Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, so. One could inject a mouse with some antigen that has multiple different epitopes. Here you can see an antigen that has four different epitopes labeled one through four here. Um, you could also inject a human, but that would not be, you know, you'd have some ethics problems there. Um, so it's not like mice are special on this one. It's just that we tend to use mice for our experiments. Um, and you could isolate spleen cells, and you could find a B cell that responds to epitope number one, a B cell that responds to epitope number two, number three, number four. And, or you could isolate the antibodies from this mouse, and you'd find an antibody responding to epitope one, an antibody responding to two, three, and four. Um, it would look something like what you see on this picture. And so that mouse would be making a polyclonal response to our yellow blobby antigen with four, its four epitopes. If we decided that we really wanted one of those antibodies for some purpose, for a monoclonal, perhaps it would be really useful in a Western blot or something like that, we wanted to produce a whole bunch of, say, antibody 2. <laughs> um, what we would actually do is take those spleen cells that you see that have been isolated at the top. Those spleen cells are an example of the cells we talked about in lab called primary cells. They come straight out of the animal, just like the ones you took out of the animal in lab. As a result, they have a short lifespan. They are, do not live indefinitely. And so you could imagine you could do some fancy work and get that turquoise cell to, that makes antibody number two. You know that because it's labeled number two. You could get that cell for some reason. And you could try to have it make antibodies for you in culture. And that would be OK, and you get some antibodies. But the cell would only live for a small amount of time. It wouldn't do many divisions. And so you'd kind of get meh amounts of antibodies. You wouldn't get a, a huge amount of antibodies. You would not be able to find to found a multi-million dollar antibody company on the back of that short-lived B cell. There are other cells, like the cells we talked about in the lab, that are transformed cells that are able to be immortal. One of those types of cells is called a myeloma cell. Um, it's the thing that you care about here is that this cell is an immortal cell. And in fact, we can mix these cells together, our B cells and our immortal myeloma cells, along with a specific uh, 
compounds in the media and the cells will actually fuse their membranes. And so you can get these hybrid cells that are partially cell number one and partially an immortal cell. These are called, since they're hybrid cells, we call them hybridomas. So we make a hybridoma. This has the immortal properties of the immortal cell and the antibody making properties of the antibody cell. And so now we've kind of gotten over this problem. We're going to culture these cells in a special media. This media is important because this media actually kills the myeloma cells that are unfused. They have a mutation in them so that they die in the presence of this media. So only a myeloma cell that got a B cell partner can live. The B cells that didn't get a myeloma cell are short lived anyway, so they're going to die. So only the hybrid cells can live in this special media called HAT media. And now you can just sort out your hybrid cells. Here you can see them all sorted. Have them make the antibodies and then test and say, oh, this one made antibody number two. I'm going to save this cell. I'm going to make infinite amounts of antibody number two because I'm going to grow this um, hybrid cell to infinity forever and ever. And I'm going to make grams of my antibody. And I'll throw away my other hybrid cells because I don't care about them. Um, that's actually how monoclonals are all made. Um, typically, what you do is when you do this um, isolation process, you do it in a 96 well plate. Um, and a 96 well plate has labeled um, rows A through H and labeled um, columns 1 through 12. So you can talk about, like, this one is in F4 or something like that. And a lot of times when you look at antibodies, they'll be named things like 2F4, which means they were on plate number two in well F4 <laughs> when you found them um, or something like that. So very often when you see antibodies with that kind of name, that's where that came from. So all of the antibodies that we talk about in all of these techniques are monoclonals that were made in the laboratory through this process. There are tons of assays out there that use antibodies. Um, they vary a lot, and we're going to kind of hit some of the highlights today. But some of the things that they vary in have to do with um, the sensitivity or how much antibody is required before you get a positive test result. So if you're testing someone for antibodies, um, or if you're, you know, you're using something antibody related, sometimes you need a lot, sometimes you only need a little to make the test work. Um, and so um, there are some things, like for example, an alkaloni double diffusion that is not used very frequently. That's because you need so much antibody before you get a positive test result. Whereas things like an ELISA, which are used pretty frequently, um, can give you positive results with very small amount of antibodies, and so we've moved towards using those. As you'll see as I walk through some of these techniques, the other big difference between all of these techniques is the form of the antigen. So you're going to see, and part of the reason why we're talking about this before we talk about flow cytometry is if you get some of these other assays, which I think are going to be really straightforward for you, then you'll see that flow cytometry is just another little tweak of it. They're all just little tweaks of each other um, where the antigen form is different. So one thing we could do is just have free antibody floating or, or free antigen floating around in fluid like this. And we could bind it to free antigen or antibody floating around in fluid like this. That would be referred to as doing an experiment where we look at antibody precipitation. Um, this can be referred to as a, a precipitin or an agglutination reaction. A precipitin reaction happens when we're talking about a free antigen. An agglutination reaction happens when we're talking about a cell surface antigen. But it's the same procedure either way. And these techniques all have in common um, some things that are shown here. 
they all take advantage of thinking about antibody concentration as well as antigen concentration. If you mix together um, antigen and antibody in a situation where there is excess antigen, so there's little antibody, there's a lot of antigen, so little antibody on this graph, you'll see that sometimes you get some antibodies that have a couple antigens bound to them. Sometimes you'll get free antigen. Everything will kind of be separate. If you mix together tons and tons and tons of antibody with a little bit of antigen, you'll get a situation where everything's separate. You'll have a few antibodies pick up an antigen. Everything else is going to stay separated. But if you get a just right amount of antigen and antibody, you will have many different antibody molecules, each binding to different antigens and coming together um, to make a big cluster, as is shown here. This is the first example of one of the most important uh, kind of theoretical ideas you're going to see in immunology this whole semester. Hopefully, you've heard of this word that I'm going to say before to you. This is an example, as you will see all semester, of the Goldilocks principle. Where too much is bad, too little is bad, it has to be just right. Just like Goldilocks and the three bears. Um, and so if you have a just right amount of antigen and antibody, you'll get this big cluster formed. And that cluster can precipitate out of solution. And you can, in fact, measure its presence. One very common uh, situation where we can do this is where we're looking at the antigens that are on the surface of our blood cells. So our blood cells have some carbohydrates on their surface. Um, you can see that some of them have a carbohydrate with a ceramide and a few linkages that are shown here. Um, and it stops at that galactose and that fucose. Some people have a galnac added onto the end. Some people have another galactose added onto the end. If you have no terminal sugar, that's called O. If you have this terminal sugar, that's A. If you have this terminal sugar, that's B. Officially, the genes for this are actually glycosyl transferases, things that add carbohydrates. Um, and so your blood cells, based on your blood type, will have a different antigen on their surface. If you're O, you have no terminal carbohydrate. If you're A, you have just this antigen. If you're B, you have this, just this antigen. If you're AB, you have both. And so we can, do a, we can do, figure out our blood type with a very simple agglutination reaction, where we mix your blood with antibodies against each of these different antigens. If the antibodies and antigens do not bind, we can't get a clump. If the antigens and antibodies do bind, then we do get a clump. Um, and so it's relatively straightforward. Um, this is um, part of that process. You can think about it as hemagglutination, agglutinating blood cells. Um, there are some ways that we use it for diagnosis. And so here you can see um, where we've actually got um, these nice uh, big clusters that have all covered the bottom of the cell. Here, everything was in solution. We centrifuged. It just went together um, at the bottom. And so you can see the difference between a positive and negative result pretty easily here. So I want to show you another version of this in a couple of different ways. So first of all, um, the Nobel Prize website has a blood typing game that we can see. Used to have a blood typing game that we used to be able to see um, that would actually allow you to play around with this and test it yourself. Um, this is where you learn the lesson that you should always test your links before your class. Um, 
So there used to be a way that you could actually do this really fun blood typing game on the Nobel Prize website. Sadly, we will not be able to do it today, but there is the link and perhaps it will be working on another day. <laughs> um, however, this is also a uh, blood typing card. And so the way that this works is that this card actually has antibodies on it um, that um, you then put a drop of blood mixed with water on the card. Um, you have a negative control. So this is what no clumping looks like. This is when the water just goes all the way across, nothing clumped together. Here we actually got some clumps. So this is a negative control. This is an antibody against A. This is an antibody against B. And this is the antibody against the Rh factor. You may have heard of Rh positive or Rh negative. That's another antigen on the surface of cells. And so this was, I actually did not know my blood type and did it one day in the lab as a demo for a previous immunology class. This is my result. Um, and so you can see that I found out that I was B positive <laughs> um, as a result of this. Um, because I got agglutination for B, I got agglutination for um, Rh positive and not any other stuff. I am working on getting versions of this card to have available in lab for a future week. I don't know when they're coming in. It's in process. <laughs> um, and that would just be an option should you so desire. So that's one way that this process, uh, that antibodies can be used um, in different techniques. We can also think about what happens if the antibody is not free in a liquid, but is instead in on a slide, like on a microscope slide, perhaps on a tissue section that you've cut from some tissue or on cells that you've put on a microscope slide. You can then treat those cells on the microscope slide with an antibody of interest that has some type of indicator on its FC portion. It might be a fluorescence indicator, or it might be an enzyme that converts a substrate. And you can then actually see where your protein of interest is on that slide. And so this is actually um, looking at um, the pancreas. Um, these cells are making insulin. These are some immune cells around them. So this is actually thinking about diabetes presence. Um, and so you can get pretty easy data from your antibodies with this. It's kind of nice because you can start to see things like what part of the cell is my antigen in. You could find out which part of the body my antigen is in. All of those good kind of things. But you have to have a slide to start with. You've got to have your, your sample on a slide. Or you've got to have a tissue section to start with. And sometimes you don't have a slide or a tissue section. Um, and so as a result, you might do your experiment in a slightly different way depending on what you have in terms of your sample for your antigen. You might have some, ce some cells, blah, 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 some cells that contain your antigen of interest. And one way you could examine it is with a Western blot, which you guys have done in Bio 250, so you should be aware of how this works. We can take a cell, and we can lyse that cell to release the proteins that are inside. You can see that we have large blue protein, medium yellow protein, and small red protein in this cell. And so we get a mixture of them after we've lysed the cells. Frequently, we will denature those proteins as well. Um, and then we'll run them on a gel to separate those proteins by size. And so you can see our big blue protein is at the top and our small red protein is at the bottom. If you recall from running SDS page gels when you've done work with proteins, those gels are pretty flimsy. They, would t they tear pretty easily. Um, and so we don't want to just have to do all sorts of things with that flimsy gel. And so instead, we use electric current to move the proteins onto a membrane, which is a much more stable solid structure. Um, and happily, it actually keeps the protein separated by size. So you can see the blue protein is still at the top, the yellow protein still in the middle, the red protein still at the bottom when we transfer to the membrane. The membrane's just now a lot more stable. We can then use antibodies against one of our proteins in order to detect whether or not it is present. And so if I had an enzyme against the yellow protein, 
I would get a band where the yellow protein is. There's no band where the other ones were, which I could then develop to look like a normal band that you see on a Western. If I had used a different antibody, I would see a different band. Um, one reason why I like showing it this way is re to remind you that all the proteins are there. It's just that you're getting a band because your antibody is specific to the protein that you're looking for. You also really need to know a lot about whether or not your antibody is detecting denatured proteins um, or proteins that are folded. Because if you were using an antibody that only recognizes folded proteins, and you denatured your proteins in putting together your Western blot, as one normally does, the answer to your experiment is going to be no, because you killed the antibody's ability to react. Um, so these types of things can be really important. The other nice thing about a Western is you do get some information about the protein size. With the immunostaining, you got some information about the protein's um, cellular location, or what cells it was on, or what uh, anatomic location it's in. Here you get some information about the protein size, um, but you don't necessarily know if it was a nuclear protein or not. You also might just have antigen that's free. Um, and you can basically do the exact same process with free antigen as well, but now we're going to call this an ELISA or an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. There are two big ways that ELISAs can work. One of them is a sandwich ELISA, which is shown here. In a sandwich ELISA, your unknown is an antigen. So, if, so I could do a sandwich ELISA to determine how much interferon is present in my sample. Interferon would be the antigen in this case, and I want to know how much of it there is, so it's my unknown. The first thing that I would do is I would coat my wells with antibody, as you see here, and that antibody is a specific antibody that binds to my antigen, in this case interferon. So I'm basically coating, I'm basically making it so I have these awesome plastic wells that can just bind to my antigen. Um, it's not shown here, but you actually then also uh, do a step where you block further protein binding onto the rest of the plastic. Um, you then can add your antigen to be measured. If it's there, it will bind to the antibody. If it's not there, it will not bind to the antibody. Here it's shown that it is there, but you could imagine that it's not there as well. You could also imagine that if I had a bunch of different wells, we could have situations where there was different amounts of the little pink dot antigen. So there are some where maybe I have two, there are some where I have one, there are some where I have 400. You can imagine there's a big difference. I'm then going to add on another enzyme that binds to that same antigen, which you can see happening here. That enzyme, or that antibody likely has an enzyme coupled to its FC portion. Um, that can convert a substrate and give you a color. And in fact, that color will look like this that you see on the bottom. Um, you can notice that there's different intensities of color, which is related to different amount of antibody binding and thus different amount of antigen present. So my zero well would be clear, my one well would be a little bit yellow, my two well would be a little more yellow, and my 400 well will be so yellow um, because of this. Um, and if I were to do something like run a standard curve um, of antigen of known concentrations, then I could figure out my concentration pretty easily from looking at this process. This is a really straightforward, really easy process. Um, this is known as a sandwich ELISA because the antigen is sandwiched between two antibodies. You made a sandwich with antibodies for the bread and antigen for the filling. We can also see an ELISA that's known as an indirect ELISA. And, and in an indirect ELISA, we are now looking for antibody instead of looking for antigen. If you were to go to the doctor's office and ask for an HIV test, 
they would perform an indirect ELISA. The way this would work is that they would take antigens, in fact, they would take antigens that are known to be from HIV, and coat them in the well. They would then take blood from you. If you have the virus, you probably have some antibodies. If you don't have the virus, you don't have the antibodies. And they would incubate it. If you have the antibody, if you've been exposed to the virus, then there's antibody that can bind to that antigen. If you didn't, then there would be no antibody that binds to that antigen. We then can use a, a second antibody that binds to the FC region of the first that, again, has that enzyme on it. That enzyme will convert the substrate, and we get the exact same color change, the exact same type of result with this indirect ELISA. What I hope you notice about all of these techniques is that they're kind of just all the same. It's just you started with the antigen in a different form, but you basically use the antibody's ability to be specific and detected stuff. I handed back your um, questions for lab one today. And one of the things we did in lab one was we thought about how to distinguish white blood cells based on morphology, how to distinguish all of these types of white blood cells under a microscope. Um, and if you recall, there were some problems in that lab. There are some reasons why that lab you know, was not the funnest thing you ever wanted to do for the rest of your life. Perhaps, maybe some of you did. Um, one of those problems was that white blood cells are pretty rare among the blood. You saw that, how rare the white blood cells were compared to the red blood cells. Um, in addition, how confident were you on your ability to do this? Um, distinction between these kind of white blood cells. So I see a lot of handshake like this. <laughs> sort of, some look good, some look bad. It wasn't, you know, something you could do super quickly and easily. I asked you to count and identify 100 different cells. How long did that take you? Hmm? So like 20 minutes. There's a pretty big variation in your answers for how long it took you, but it takes, and that was to get 100 cells. As many of you noted in your answers, if you wanted to get more accurate data, one of the ways you could do that was to get a larger number, but that would take more time. So there's some difficulties in this process. Another thing that's difficult in this process has to do with lymphocytes. If you recall, you labeled things as lymphocyte when you did your experiment. But in fact, lymphocyte is a really broad group of cells. Lymphocytes contain T cells and, in fact, multiple kinds of T cells. It contains B cells and multiple kinds of B cells. It contains NK cells and multiple kinds of NK cells. Um, your textbook shows this little distinction. And they all look like that thing you called lymphocyte. So if you want to know something about lymphocytes, like, say, a C4 count for an AIDS patient, this is not going to cut it because the different kinds of lymphocytes don't look any different. Um, and so when I was a graduate student, I made a graph. Uh, a big part of what I did as a gra in grad school was actually that I was looking at um, this vaccine response. And I needed to measure how the specific response I was making um, changed over time after my vaccine, and I needed to measure the number of CD8 positive T cells at different days after my infection. So I wanted to basically make a graph of the primary and secondary immune response, which I did. But in doing that, I had to be able to tell which cell was the CD8 T cell that recognized HIV, apart from which cell was the CD8 T cell that recognized flu, which I certainly couldn't do with a microscope and the right stain like you saw in the lab. And I had to be able to tell which of those cells were which compared to the CD4 T cells, the neutrophils, the monocytes, the NK cells, the gamma delta cells, et cetera, the B cells, all of which are here at appropriate numbers. So I had to be able to pick those needles out of a haystack if I really wanted to make that graph. Um, this is a thing that most immunologists do all the time. And there are two pieces of this that I want to tell you. Well, there are a few pieces of this I want to tell you. 
The way that we really do this is that each of our important types of immune cells is, has been described to have some specific proteins on its surface. Some of those proteins are listed here as an example. And those proteins could be antigens that antibodies bind to. You will see that many of them have names that are CD and then a number. Sometimes when people learn immunology, they get all freaked out about, freaked out about the CDs. And so I want to tell you what the CDs are right now, because I am sort of baffled about why people have trouble with the CDs. Basically what happened is some people made some antibodies against proteins on the cell surface. And they were just making antibodies against proteins on the cell surface, having a good old time. And then they realized that, wait, I don't actually know if my antibody and Emilio's antibody recognize the same protein or different proteins. Oops. And so they made a standardization system to test them. And they didn't necessarily know what the proteins were or what they did. They were just proteins. And they knew some were the same and some were different. And they had to figure out a way to label them. And so they said that mine was called protein number one, and Emilio's was protein number two, and Alina's was protein number three. They just counted, because counting's easy. And in fact, um, they referred to them as things like CD1, the cluster of differentiation number one. It's just protein number one. <laughs> or CD2, or CD3, or CD4. It, they, they're just numbering the proteins. That's all it is. Um, if you look in the back of your textbook, there's a CD chart. If you look in my lab, there's a CD chart. I mean, I'll just always have a CD chart somewhere. Um, um, Generally, you learn the ones that you actually use frequently. The rest of them you just look up in a chart when you need them. And so you'll see charts like this that will tell you, oh, CD35 is such and such receptor. It's present on these cells. Um, we, you might find some interesting information about it if you have to learn about it. Um, many of them do have other names. Um, for the most part, we try to stick with using that standardized CD nomenclature. Some, for a few of them, we use the other name just because everyone's used to it. Um, but we try to always use the CD nomenclature. And really, the reason for this is this. So this is actually one of the first, the first paper I had to read, my first assignment in grad school. And if you look at it, it says uh, the CC chemokine thymus derived chemotactic agent for TCA4 secondary lymphoid tissue chemokine 6C kine exodus 2. Blah, 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 blah. All of those are the same name, are just names for this protein that different people found. And so you could imagine how confusing this is if you worked on uh, chemotactic agent, thymus derived chemotactic agent 4, TCA4, if you tried to do a search. And it turns out all the other people who were publishing on your favorite protein were calling it Exodus 2. And so instead of having this crazy naming system, which happens because we have a really old field where people have been studying blood cells for a long time, we made a standardized system. <laughs> That's all the CD system is, is just a standardized system so we don't have this kind of crazy nomenclature to keep track of. That's all the CDs are. Don't let them intimidate you. Many of those CDs are the characteristic proteins on the surface of our white blood cells, our leukocytes. And so you can see those again shown here. So for example, all T cells have CD3 on their surface. Um, CD8 T cells have CD8 along with CD3. CD4 T cells have CD4 along with CD3. Um, NK cells have a protein called NK1.1. Um, you can sort of see what this pattern looks like. Then all we can do is the same procedure we've been doing through every other assay here, where we just use antibodies <laughs> to determine which cell's which. So we c I can find my CD8 positive T cells by finding cells that bind to both a CD3 antibody and a CD8 antibody. And so if I use a CD3 antibody that has a blue fluorescent tag and a CD8 antibody that has a red fluorescent tag, I just find the cells that have both blue and red, and I found my cells of interest. And I can do this um, very easily. So this should make a lot of sense compared to the other assays we've been talking about. It's the same thing. 
But what I haven't told you is how I can do this in a very rapid way. It took you 20 minutes to look at 100 cells, right? Because you can imagine I could just do this process and then put it on a slide and look under a microscope just like I did with immunostaining. But that wouldn't be very fast. It would still take a really long time. So instead, we have invented a machine known as a flow cytometer that allows us to do this whole process much faster. Before you do flow cytometry, you first mix the cells with your fluorescent antibody. So you can see that my cells that went into my cytometer already have the antibody bound. And the first part of tomorrow's lab, you're going to be labeling your cells with antibodies. There are times when people use things like fluorescent dyes. People have come up with all sorts of fancy tricks here. But you got to get some fluorescent label on the cells first. You can then, and so what you'll notice is that there are some cells, for example, that have the red square antibody. Some cells have no antibody. Some have yellow triangle antibody. Some have both. Whatever, you've got a whole mixture. It's a very heterogeneous set of cells going in. You mix them in a big volume of liquid. And then you actually mess with, the machine messes with the pressure that is implied, that is Im not implied, applied, um, such that you get droplets forming that have one cell per droplet. And so basically, we have all of these droplets that have one cell per droplet. Here it's shown as falling. I'll sh when I show you our cytometer tomorrow, ours is not gravity-based. Um, but the basic idea of one cell falling per droplet is the same. So we have each of these one cell per droplet. And then we shine a laser at them and can capture some information with some detectors that are a part of our computer. Um, most of this works based on fluorescence excitation and emission. So we're going to shine a, a laser on our antibody that has this tag on its uh, FC portion. And that will lead to emitted light of some type of wavelength. We will know what to sh shine on, what to use for excitation, and what to use for emission. And then we just measure, is there any green light coming off? of our cell. Um, these are um, some of the uh, dyes that people use. So we can actually just look at the emission of different wavelengths. If you want to look in more detail at how this works, um, this is a spectrum viewer um, from one of the big flow cytometry companies. I choose this one because our cytometer is from BD Biosciences. It's called a BD Accuracy C6. And so you can actually look at the spectrum of our machine if you want on this website. Um, and so we can detect a few things as we shine the laser on our cells. If you remember, I just told you that our machine is called an Accuracy C6. And that's actually because we can measure six things on it. Um, two of the things that we measure have nothing to do with fluorescence. They're actually physical parameters of the cell. I am going to draw this. Um, if Dr. Larson was here, she would you know, be very sad because her description of this physics is way better than mine. But mine will work for now. So one of the things that we do, so here's the cell. And we shine a light on it with our laser. And one thing that happens when we do that is that the light gets bent around the cell. And we can have a detector here that shows how much the light got bent. And if we think about different cells, the light is going to be bent different amounts based on how big the cell is. So a little cell is not going to bend the light in the same way a big cell is. And so the first thing we can actually do is get an estimate of cell size. 
using this machine by looking at how much the light is bent around the cell. That is known as the forward scatter, which is not labeled, oh, forward scatter, which is labeled right here, um, sometimes known as FSC. This is the one Dr. Larson would really hate. So we can also imagine two cells of the same size where one of them is maybe something like lymphocyte where it doesn't have much stuff in it. Remember how they weren't very granular? And one of them is a granulocyte that has a lot of granules. We might refer to this as the granularity of this cell. Sometimes people will even talk about it as its internal complexity. If we shine a light on both of these cells, it's going to get bounced around a lot by all of these granules. <laughs> Whereas it's not going to get bounced as much through this cell. This is going to be referred to as the side scatter, and it gives us a measure of the internal complexity or granularity of the cell. And so you can see we also measure the side scatter. In addition, on our machine, we can look at four different fluorescent parameters. So we can get four different fluorescent colors along with size and granularity on every cell that we measure. And the way that this works, in the end, the cells, after they fall, get looked at by the laser. The data goes to the computer. The cells go in the trash can. That's my trash can that I drew. Um, there are cytometers out there that run 18 colors in addition to forward and side scatter, so you can get a whole lot of information about your cell. Um, when I was in grad school, I would frequently run about 100,000 cells in two minutes. So remember your 20 minutes for 100 cells? Um, I would get 20 parameters on 100,000 cells in two minutes. Um, so um, we are not going to get, we're not going to be running at that kind of flow rate tomorrow, but we are still going to have many thousands of cells in about two minutes. Um, and in fact, you will have to answer that on part of the lab is how many cells you got in how many minutes um, and compare that. Often the data may look something like this. And all of the data that I'm going to show you, the cytometry data, um, or the majority of the cytometry data I'm going to show you is data that I collected when I was in grad school. So this is, so might be something that you see. This is a forward scatter plot that I'm showing you on the x-axis versus side scatter on the y-axis. Um, for some reason, when people do their data analysis, if they're on the east coast, they always put forward on the x-axis and side on the y. If they're on the west coast, they do it the other way. So sometimes if you like see me reading a paper and see me like turn my head like this, <laughs> that's going on. Um, you pick where, which parameter is on which axis, so there's not like a specific reason if you're drawing plots on the exams. I, as long as you tell me what you put on what axis, I don't care which one's on Y and which one's on X. Um, each of these dots is a cell. And we get the specific size information and the specific granularity information for each cell here. Um, and so this data is shown in dots. It's called a dot plot. It's most commonly what we see. Um, we can show it in other ways. So sometimes people, instead of showing dots, will show um, a density plot or a contour plot like this, where you can see where the dots are most closely bunched and where they aren't. Because like, you can't really tell here whether there are more cells right there or more cells right there. At some point, it just looks black. <laughs> um, so you could do a density plot to give you that density information. Um, some software now does this thing called pseudocolor, where you get the dot, the individual dots, and a coloration about density. Because um, I need to see dots. I just have to see the dots when I look at this. <laughs> um, so that's the way this will look. You can also um, set your data up as a histogram, where instead of looking at one or at two parameters, one versus the other, you can just look at one parameter. So here I'm looking at the amount of CD3 on my cells and the amount of CD8 on my cells. 
Here I'm just looking at how many cells have a lot of CD3, how many cells have a little CD3. I have a number of cells on the y-axis, and I'm just looking at one parameter. And here's the same data, um, the CD8s, how many have a lot of CD8, how many have a little CD8. Um, if you twist your head, you can kind of see these match up um, to the others. So you can do histogram data as well. Um, all of which is stuff that you sort of choose in your software. So if you look at some of the different uh, pieces of data that I've shown you, like here and going forward, sometimes it just looks like you have a whole mess of cells. And sometimes the cells seem to be in like discrete groups. Like you have here, it kind of looks like four or five groups of cells. So you've got one group of cells that are all kind of similar here, one group of cells that are all kind of similar here, one here, one here, one there. You can argue about whether those are two separates or whether that's all one. Um, so sometimes you get the cells that you get cells sort of all having a bunch of similar properties. Sometimes you just get them all over the place. And when they have similar properties like this, you start to talk about them as populations. When you have populations of cells, the awesome thing you can do with this machine is draw circles around it or draw polygons around it in your software and get information about those cells. So one thing that I can do is on data that looks like this, I can say, you know what, it looks to me as though there are three populations of cells. One group here that is on the, sort of on the smaller side and is, is not granular. One group that's kind of bigger and medium granular. And one group that's sort of meh size but super granular. Can you kind of see how there are those three populations? This is blood, and that's the lymphocytes, monocytes, and granulocytes. And so not even using any fluorescence, not even using anything, I can get lymphocytes, monocytes, granulocytes out of my plot just like that, um, just by knowing what I should look for here. And in fact, I can get date numbers. So you can see that 60.7% of my cells are lymphocytes, 3.81 are monocytes, and 28.4 are granulocytes in this particular sample. Um, so I can get a lot of that data, and that's pretty cool. But then I can do something else that's awesome. I could then, in my software, click on any of those populations and further analyze it. And so I can take each of those three populations and say, okay, now just within these cells, ignore everybody else. If I just look at the ones that were in this circle, what's going on with their CD3 levels and their CD8 levels? And I can look at that for each of my populations, and I might see something that looks like this, where you can see like here, most of them have low CD8, low CD3. Here you've got three different group or four different groups pretty nicely. And so you can start to see different things. This is referred to as gating. Um, it's something that you choose in your cytometer. And it is uh, something that um, you sort of do by, uh, do a little bit by experience. You can, if we had a cytometer that did, you know, 18 colors, you could do this and then you could subset the cells out like this and then you could be, well, I only actually care about these guys and subset them out and then you could subset them out and you could just keep going and going and going with your 18 colors um, and really start to look at lots of unique individual populations. Yeah, Molly. I have a question that might be stupid, but... No stupid um, questions. this example, this sample is mm -hmm. blood, uh -huh. Great question. Um, so uh, this sample, I had already gotten rid of, I'd purified out the red blood cells. So I'd removed them, and the process that I used to remove them also removed some granulocytes, which is why the granulocyte number is so low. Um, so this had been treated in a specific way. Um, but that's a great question. Um, typically, you, you pull the, the red blood cells out before you run it on the cytometer. Um, so this is sort of another example of the gating. So here, um, the investigator picked a group of cells whose uh, physical parameters were what they were interested in. And then they went ahead and 
looked at them to at their expression of some other different markers and they said aha i like this these blue cells and i like these red cells and they said of my blue cells what percent of them have this next marker and you could go on and on and on notice that there are always numbers so you can either get percents or you can get raw numbers of cells that are in each of your analysis groups as you do this just spit right out for you from the computer um, these are a couple examples of flow data. Um, so I want to show you a couple different things here. Um, so on the left is actual data um, from a paper. In the middle is the same basic type of data from a textbook. Um, yes, it looks like a bird. My uh, class in grad school were a little snarky. And we decided to make ourselves a class flag, and it was the bird. And <laughs> this, this, this we decided was our mascot, was this bird. Um, so this is um, specifically what you see from one very famous analysis. The details of it are not important right now. You will, oh, you will know those details later. But right now, you don't care. Right now, there are a few things I want to tell you about reading these data. First of all, this is what the data actually looks like when it sort of comes off the machine. You as the investigator can draw these lines to draw it into quadrants of four parts. You could also draw circles or other types of polygons as well. If you draw quadrants, the percents add up to 100, because that's how percents work. Um, so what you can see here is that we have CD4, um, the amount of CD4 protein. So really, it's the amount of. Uh, fluorescent antibodies that bound to CD4 protein on the y-axis, the amount that bound to CD8 protein on the x-axis. And here you can see that they, we've separated pretty nicely into four populations. One population has low amounts of CD8. So this is CD8. It's on the left side here. So it has a low amount of CD8. And it has a low amount of CD4. We might call that CD4 negative, CD8 negative. Notice that in, I don't just say negative, negative. I actually indicate what parameters I was measuring, CD4 and CD8. These have a high amount of CD8, but they still have a low amount of CD4. So I might call them uh, CD8 positive, CD4 negative. These I would call CD4 positive, CD8 negative, because they're high on the CD4 axis, but they're still low on the CD8 axis. Um, these I would call uh, CD8 positive, CD4 positive, or whatever, because they're high or positive on both axes. Um, so that's how we would do that. In this case, because this is a famous plot, we talk about double negatives, double positives, single positives. For now, don't worry so much about that. Um, that whether you call it a double neg or double pause is really based on this specific analysis. If I were to draw this on an exam, or if I were to ask you to draw this on an exam, this is what I would be looking for. First of all, you should draw axes. And you should label the axes. Um, if you're going to have quadrants and you want to draw quadrants, you can. That's fine. We've got four populations, and so you would draw four circles. This one, you can see there's not very many cells. There's only 3% here. And so I would draw a small circle. <laughs> this one's really big. It's 80%. And so I would draw a big circle. <laughs> These are sort of in the middle. And so I would draw medium-sized circles. <laughs> and the, this is how I would draw that plot on an exam or um, I would, if I would ask you to draw it. I care about circle size if population sizes are really different um, and which quadrants they're in when I'm asking you guys for this stuff. One other thing that I want to mention really quickly about this is that one thing that you should notice here, because sometimes this throws people off, is if I asked you what percent of the total cells here are CD8 positive, what would your answer be? Yeah, Molly. Molly says 85% are CD8 positive. Molly, why is 85% CD8 positive? 
Exactly. So you can add so you can add those percentages together pretty easily. All right, so now here's going to be your really tricky question, Molly. What percent of the CD8 positive cells are also CD4 positive? Of the CD8 cells are also CD4 positive. Or at least tell me how you would do that math. Anyone want to phone a friend? Let's see, Mal. Uh, yeah, so 80 divided by 85 would be the answer to tell me what percent. And so realize that throws people off on one of the problem set questions big time. So I wanted to make sure I went through it specifically <laughs> so that you can think about that, that you can actually you know, subdivide the populations a little bit in your head or combine or um, do them differently. Um, so. This is actually how I went about making this graph um, when I was in grad school. I basically found how many cells were both CD8 positive and HIV specific. I got a percent, it was 3.05%, and then I made my graph. That was easily how I did it. There's one other thing that I want to point out. I know I'm going a teensy bit over. Um, the last two slides are about mice, and those I'll, we'll deal with at some other point. They're kind of a little bit off topic, but this is the one last thing I want to tell you about. Um, Flow cytometry is sometimes also called FACS, F-A-C-S. FACS as an acronym specifically stands for fluorescence activated cell sorting. And since I'm a picky person who's done a lot of both of these techniques, I differentiate between general flow cytometry and FACS. If you remember with our, our flow cytometry before, when we finished with the cell, we threw it in the trash can. Basically, all we did was analyze the cells. We got data about the cells, but we didn't save them for any purpose. You can't, some machines have the ability to let you sort as well. They're called sorters, or fax sorters. Um, they work just like a normal cytometer, except that when the droplet falls, the um, nozzle actually gives it a charge. So it makes it like positively charged, we'll say. The computer reads some data about that cell and decides, do I want this cell or do I not want this cell? And as it's falling, it changes the charge on two different plates to either divert the cell into different directions so that you can save it in different tubes based on what parameters it has and actually use it for some later purpose. So you can physically sort cells if you have a sorter. There are two fun things about sorting to mention. One of them is somebody wrote a funny thing on Twitter recently. Um, so this is somebody who said that this was a high mag video of a sorter, um, which in some ways is kind of true. Here's his high mag video of the sorter. So you can see that it's physically just sorting out the cells and pushing them apart. That's really how it works. The other, there's one other fun fact that I will end you off with today. Have you heard the word facts before in your life? Shaking your head, yes, where? What's, what's facts? If you went out and asked somebody on the street, what's facts? facts A fax machine, like where you send the papers, right? You're sending a copy of the papers when you do that. When you send a copy of the paper, you are sending a facsimile of the paper, a copy. And so if you designed a machine that was going to send a facsimile of something, you might want to call it a fax machine. Sadly, for the company who developed the fax machine, there was a machine that was patented the year before, the fluorescence activated cell sorter that took the name FACS. <laughs> Thus, Xerox, when it did this, had to name their machine fax with an X because they had X's in their names and stuff. So also fun immunology fact for your day. Um, I'll see you guys in lab tomorrow. Uh, make sure you remember your assignment and uh, we'll talk later. <laughs>